Welcome to yet another episode of Mark and Mark, a closer look. Mark Shine, Mark Miller. Hey, you guys had a great tournament draw show on Sunday, and it's starting to be time to think about that. Well, it? first of all, I really appreciate sales getting together. They did a great job of selling that hour show. We got great contributions from Aaron Matthews and the three coaches he brought in. Sean Bully, Nick Berkey. It was a fun thing to do. It's still on YouTube if you want to go see it. It was a great event to put that thing together and prep the tournament because here it comes. It won't be long, but we got some league championships to finish up, and we've got some review games that'll go a long way towards telling who's going to win those leagues, and you got started. Well, first of all, let's go to the NWC. Let's look at Paulding at Crestview. Crestview came in. Remember when they were four and three, and we were all kind of doubting the Crestview Knights? Well, those losses were to Van Wert by four, Fort Jennings by eight, and Ottoville by four. Since that time, they were on a 10-game winning streak and were 5-0 in the Northwest Conference play. Pauling had won three in a row. They were 8-8. Eight eight. They were 4-1 and one in conference play. So this was their chance for the Panthers to try to catch up in the conference. But Pauling goes up 33-23 at half. They're still up six to start the fourth quarter. But a huge fourth quarter for the Knights, 27-8. And Crestview wins 69-56. Etzler with 24, including three from the three-point line. Drew Klein, he's coming alive offensively, Mark. He had 19 with one. Wade Sheets had 10. Marcus Miller had 20, made four three-point field goals. Jarrett Miller had 11. Carson Schull had 11. They made 13 threes, did the uh, Paulding Panthers. Paulding now had beat Liberty Center on Saturday night, 68-55. They have Lincoln View at home this week, and Crestview beat Wayne Trace. That's a big win for them, 72-42. Mm -hmm. Etzler had 23 again, climb with 15. Here he comes, and the Crestview Knights will host Spencerville this week, trying to get an outright championship. Hey, let's look at the MAC. This weekend went a long ways to crystallizing who's going to win that league. First of all, St. Henry and Versailles. St. Henry got him by two, 46-44. Mark and I were there. That moves St. Henry to 17-3, 6-1 in the league. Tyler Schlarman again led him with 16 points. Devin Hulskamp had 10. For Versailles, they dropped to 16-4, 6-2 in the league. That's their second league loss in a row. A.J. Arns had 17. Justin Arns had 14. This was a story about St. Henry playing a box and one on Justin Arns. Ryan Lutmer followed him everywhere, including to the locker room at halftime. I'm joking about that. The backdoor cut to Curtis Ulenek for the winning basket. This was a great game. And then Marion Local and Versailles got together last night. Marion Local wins 52-47. That's the second of the two losses in a row for Versailles. Marion Local moves to 15-4, 7-0, and in first place all alone in the MAC. Tyler Mesher, Nathan Bruns, they had great games. Offensively, defensively, floor game, they did it all. Versailles drops to 6-2 and two in the league now. Kyle Jones coming back his second game, able to hit some threes and keep them in it for a while. This was a really good game all the way down, but what was the difference again? A box and one on Justin Arns. He was held to seven points by Matt Rethman. Remember him in football, how fast he was? He's just as quick on a basketball floor. Very physical game, A.J. Arns, Tyler Mesher, battled personal fouls the whole way, but this was a great game, and you're seeing what a packed house it was at Marion Local and how they got excited and rushed the court at the end of the game. I thought Marion Local only played football. They, well, apparently they yeah. play basketball too, huh? Yeah, they do, and we had a good time looking at their banners and their trophy case, and oh my goodness, what a fun place to go to. How about that, and congratulations, Flyers now in the driver's seat when oh, it comes there to There you go, there there's, go. The there's the trophy, trophy case. case. Look at that. One of our guys took a picture. That is the state championship trophy case. All the different sports are in there. It sits right outside the entrance to the gym. And uh, we took a picture of it, and I turn around, there's three or four other people taking pictures, probably from Versailles. And uh, the banner, they've got so many banners in their gym, they hid the, 19, the 2017 one, the most recent, way up in the corner. It's the only spot they had yeah, for that, They're going to have to build an annex on that thing yes, before they long are. right there. Yes, All right, well, let's move to the NWCC then and what happened between Elgin and USV. Elgin came in at 4-1 in conference play, thanks to a loss to the Waynesfield Goshen Tigers. And USV came in at 5-0 in conference play, including winning 11 of their last 12 games. But Elgin scored the first 12 points in the basketball game. USV got back in it. They were down 8 at the end of the first quarter. It was tied as we, with 5.50 to go in the game. USV actually took a lead, 44-43, with 1.23 left. It was tied at 44. And Peyton hudson Bueller made a jump shot at the buzzer to win the basketball game for Elgin. That was by a, a, just a two-point margin. Hopson Bueller had 17, Colin Reif had 10, and now we're tied, each with a single loss in conference play as we head into this coming weekend. Quinn Sanders had 10, and Wayne Lowry had 10 as well. USV beat Corey on Saturday night, 64-49, 27 from Sanders, 14 from Daniels, 10 from Lowry. They are at Riverside for a piece of the championship this week. 
Elgin hosts Frederickstown on Tuesday, and then they have Hard Northern on Friday as they try to play for a piece of the NWCC championship as well. All right, let's move to the Shelby County Athletic League. Two of the three teams played this weekend. Anna, 59 at Fort Loramie, 55. Again, a packed house. It was senior night. There were mullet shirts all over the place. <laughs> it was a lot of fun again for Mark and I. Uh, Abby bought one. Yeah, well, there's some mullet shirts around here right. now, too. Yeah. Anna moves to 17-4. and four. They are 9-2 and two in the league. Bart Bixler had 14. Wyatt Benzman, 13. Riley Hillscamp had 12. And boy, did he have a game on defense with just his general hustle. Uh, Fort Loramie, they go to 19-2 and two and 9-2. and two, Both losses to Anna, home and away. They were missing 6-foot-7-inch Tyler Siegel, home with an illness. But Dylan Braun did all he could with 23 points to keep him going. Friday, they are at Rushi, who is 10-1 in the SCAL. Anna is certainly cheering for a Fort Loramie win so they can get a piece of that championship in a three-way tie. Yeah, it could be a three-way tie if we get to that. That was a really fun atmosphere to be a part of, too. Sure you felt was. bad for Fort Loramie being short a couple of players, or a player, certainly in Siegel, but a nice win for the Rockets anyway. Well, one of the big non-conference games we look forward to every year is Ottawa Glandor matching up with Lexington, two of the better programs in Northwestern Ohio, and two teams that have met in the tournament before. Lexington came in at 15-5. and five. They were 8-3 and three in the Ohio Cardinal Conference. They have won eight of their last nine games. Their only loss in there was to the leader of the conference, and that was my, to Mount Vernon by 10. OG was 19-0. They were 7-0 in the Western Buckeye League, having beaten Kenton the night before, 101-57. They couldn't get it going offensively, however, against Lexington in the first half. Uh, OG had just 17 points at halftime, nine in the first quarter, eight in the second, and Lexington was up 24-17 at half. It was tied at 38. Uh, Lexington went on a little bit of a run, ended up making a jump shot by Bryant Girard with 1.2 seconds to go to win 54-53 after OG had taken a lead. Cade Stover with 23, including two from the three-point line. Josh Aiello had 10. Jay Kaufman had 21, a couple of three-point bombs, and Jake Dybel had 10. Lexington gets a chance this weekend to avenge that loss to Mount Vernon because they are at Mount Vernon at home at Lexington this weekend for a chance to tie up in that conference play. OG, which we'll talk about a little bit later on, they go to Wapak and a chance to win the Western Buckeye League outright. That's kind of like a regional tournament it game is. there. That, it is. That's always a fun event. Yeah. Which school hosts it? Two good teams and two good programs. Hey, let's move on to stat stuffers. I got the first okay. one. Peyton Judy from Fort Recovery had 22 points, four threes in their win over Coldwater, 54-51. And then he had 20 in their win over Northwestern, 65-62 in overtime. So they needed all of his points to get two wins this week. Just don't forget how young Fort Recovery is. That's going to be a good basketball team this year and into the future. Ivan Berry from Arlington, he had 21 in their win over Macomb. That was a 55-44 win. Arlington has now won six out of seven. They've won seven out of their last nine, and they're prepping for the tournament with the Red Devils right now. Eric Ritter, Corey Rawson had 33 in their win over Riverdale. They won 63-58, and then 15 in a loss to USV, 64-49. He had two threes each night. Caleb Kinney got it going for Parkway this week. He had 31, including three from the three-point line. A huge Parkway win as they went over a hard north of 103-30. Parkway's one of those teams in the MAC. You get them in the tournament and watch out what they might do. But Caleb Kinney with 31 this week. Austin May from Liberty Benton. We talked about him a lot during football season. He's a good basketball player, too, even though Liberty Benton's having a rough year. He had 26 points and a three and a loss to Hopewell, 51-43, and then 32 in their win over Elmwood. They won just by two, 58-56. Delphus Jefferson got big games out of Alex Rohde this week, and he had 13 of their 47 in a 47-35 win over Spencerville, then 24 in their, their win over Rushi on Saturday night. Now that's a big upset right there. Mm -hmm. uh, Jefferson outscored Rushi 66-59. Alex Rohde had 24 of those. Congratulations, Jefferson. Good weekend yeah, for them. Yeah. Chayton Overholt from Lincoln View. 22 points and six threes in their win over Ada. They won 53-39. Stat stuffers keep giving us stuff to talk about. Kids are scoring lots of thousand point scores. And that's our bright spot yep. for today, Mark. We had several area players go over a thousand points. Let's kind of put the, the bracket up on the screen here. Heather Lambers from Lipsick. I got a couple of ladies do it. Heather Lambers from Lipsick. She put 23 in and a win over Corey. Uh, they defeated Corey 57 21. That puts her over the thousand point mark. And mm -hmm. Casey Carroll from USV, even though they lost in overtime, Casey Carroll to Elgin 62 57. Casey Carroll went over the 1,000 point for USV as well. And then a couple of boys, Daniel Unruh from Elida had 10 points in their loss to Shawnee, but that put him over 1,000. And Jacoby Kelly from Van Wert had 13 in a loss to St. Henry. 
but that put him over 1,000. So four more 1,000-point clubbers from our area this weekend alone. Hey, we had some coaching milestones, too, and uh, two guys uh, locally went got their 100th victory. Congratulations to Brian Kuhlman from Miller City. They beat Kaleida by 10, 52-42, and Nate Barhorse from Anna. They beat Botkin 66-45 and got their 100th win. You got somebody that's been at it a little bit longer I guess than so. That. Dave Kleeman, congratulations, Dave, up at Ottoville. We've been following his program for years, 26 of them, as a matter of fact, because Dave now has 500 wins, just 121 losses, has never had a losing season. How about this? Twice in his 26 years, they won 13 games. That's the least amount of games they've won in a season. <laughs> always winning at least 13 games in a season. They beat Delphi St. John 60 to 20 the other night, and that gives him 500 wins against 121 losses, and they'll be good in the tournament again. He's gonna rack up more than just 500 before this season's over. Yep, he sure will. We did his game earlier down at Minster, and he is just, uh, he, he, he's a coach now. He is, he he's a coach, coach. And the girls love him, and they play well. He is, uh, no wonder he got 500. He got good players. Yeah, there's yes, a reason does. for that. Yeah, that's right. All right, let's look at our College Player of the Week, and it is former Lima senior Spartan, and now with the Michigan Wolverines, Xavier Simpson. Let's take a look at what Xavier has done. We know what he did as a 2014 at Lima Central Catholic. They won a state championship with a two-point win over Cleveland St. Joe Villanueva, and he was obviously one of the key players in that particular program. Then his father took the job at Lima Senior, so he moved over there, and now Xavier, with his senior year, was All-Ohio Mr. Basketball in 2016. That's the fourth Lima player to do that. He was also Division I Player of the Year in 2015 and First Team All-Ohio in 2015 and 2016. And he was First Team All Three Rivers Conference a couple times, including winning an academic award at, uh, for Lima Senior when he was in the Three Rivers Conference. Then he goes on to the University of Michigan as a freshman last year. Remember the big upset run they had where they got to the Sweet 16? They upset the number two seed Louisville along the way. He played in all 38 games for Michigan last year. And now this year, well, Michigan's 20 and seven. They're nine and five in the Big Ten Conference. They have Iowa at home on Wednesday and Ohio State at home next Sunday. Xavier has started 15 games, kind of a three-man rotation at the point guard there. He averages 6.7 points per game, plays 24 minutes a game. He's getting 2.7 rebounds a game at what, 5'11", yeah. whatever he is. He's had 99 assists in those 27 basketball games. That's a leader on his team. Also leads his team in steals right now, and just one of those classy players we like to watch, even if he is wearing maize and blue. All right, good job, Mark Shine, good research. Well, the rule of the week this week has to do with traveling, one of my favorite signals. <laughs> so Mark Shine's gonna clarify that. What is traveling and what is not Yeah, traveling? well, let's look at a couple situations that occur. We all know, I think, an idea about establishing a pivot foot and all those type of things, but what about a couple things that we're not quite sure of that comes up during the course of a game? First of all, the ball is rolling loose on the floor. Can I go and get it and slide and get the basketball? Yes, you can. Well, what if you continue to slide? That's okay as long as your momentum continues along with the basketball. You are allowed to slide, catch the ball, and continue until you come to a stop. Can't get up, and that's the key. Can't get to one knee, can't push yourself up and stand up, but as long as you're on the floor with the ball, you're okay in that particular situation. The same thing applies with falling down. Can I just rebound the basketball, have a pass to me, and slip and fall? As long as you don't roll over, as long as you don't try to get up, as long as you don't get onto one knee, you're okay. There's even a special situation in the rule book. What if I'm laying on the floor with a basketball and I set it down and pick it up, uh, get up, stand up, and then pick it up? Is that a travel? Yeah, it is. I'm not sure whoever would have tried that, but apparently <laughs> enough that somebody actually had to put it right in the rule book. And then something that you and I talked about the other night, and the question is, can I fumble, recover the basketball, dribble it, and fumble it again and go get it? Or can I dribble, fumble it, and go get it, and then dribble it again? And the answer is, you can fumble, recover, dribble the basketball, lose control of it, go get it, and pick it up. That is legal. You can fumble, recover the basketball, dribble it, pick it up, and fumble it again and still go get it, and that is not a travel. So certain situations that occur during the course of a basketball game and a couple things involving traveling we can look at. All right, good job. There we go. Uh, that, it was crystal clear till that last one. I think the old rule was easier. <laughs> All right, well, you can fumble, dribble, and okay. fumble. Okay, there you go. And if you fumble twice on the same play, coach wouldn't be happy. No, uh, because fumble in football is really, <laughs> no, really not bad. Not a good thing. <laughs>
All right. Hey, we were down at St. Henry and did that game. We told you about that a little while ago. But before the game, we interviewed a couple of guys. Mark and I, when we drove down a few weeks ago, we saw a sign that said the St. Henry Booster Athletic Complex future site. We didn't know what that meant. So we started asking questions. Dennis Wendell, the AD, clarified it told us it's a project that the community is doing, not the school really, and gave us the name of two guys, Eric Busher and Eric Hillscamp. They are the booster president and I think the, the building project manager kind of thing of this project. We interviewed them and we're gonna let you take a look at that now as they tell us about the St. Henry Athletic Booster Club Project. Hey, we have a special interview tonight uh, here as we're talking to them before the big game for sales in St. Henry and we wanna talk to guys about a new project. I guess it's not really new. It's been going on for quite a while. It is called the St. Henry Booster Athletic Complex. We've seen signs when we've come to do games lately, and now we've got the two guys that know most about it. Right next to me is Eric Busher, and over by Mark is Eric Hillscamp, and we're just going to have them inform us about this project. Uh, Eric, first of all, just tell us uh, what is this project? What's in this building that you guys want to build? Right. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Um, well, we're, we're looking at building a, a, a two-court uh, athletic complex. It's going to include a, um, a, a large uh, weight room, and it's going to be used for both school and community um, uh, events. Where's it going to be located? It's going to be loaded, located just east of the school. Mm -hmm. And, uh, should be very convenient then. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Eric, you guys have been in the process now for what, 16 to 18 months raising funds. How's that gone? You know, it's been fantastic actually. Um, between all the funds that the boosters have raised over the years, like Mark said, it's an ongoing process for a number of years. And with the pre-approved loans and with the generous donations from the community, we've raised over a million dollars, which is a pretty fantastic number if you think about it. There's no taxpayer money, there's no school money, there's no state money that's funding this building. It's, it's strictly donations and nonprofits. So it's a pretty amazing accomplishment thus far. We're hoping to get to that 1.5. Um, that's the ultimate goal. And uh, we'll wait and see once what happens. You can see a schematic behind the Eric's there, give you a little look at what it's gonna look like. Um, why? Why do you think you need this? But we come down here and the facilities look nice, but with all the youth teams, you need more, don't you? We do, we do. yeah. So for many, many years, the, the, the high school sports teams have had their space, but over the years, uh, youth sports, club sports have, have grown tremendously. Um, so so the, the, the gym space is getting tight. And, um, and then again, a need for um, a community. Um, you know, we have, a, we have a walking track around, around the uh, perimeter of the basketball court. So, you know, more community use, as well as these club sports, you know, um, club basketballs, volleyballs, you know, youth sports, things like that. All right. Eric, you've been talking about uh, the, the, the fundraising part of this. What's the time frame? When do you want to break ground? When do you want to get going? You know what? It's really a question of, of, of how, how we think the fundraising is going to go. We really hope um, through the school board's approval and stuff that we can wait out until we get to that 1.5 so we can build this amazing complex behind us. But, but if we don't get to that, then we have some really great alternatives, you know, maybe downsizing the building just a bit. But we really hope we don't have to. It's going to be an amazing building the way it is. Um, with that all said and done, you know, we're looking at not breaking ground until summertime just because we have to wait and think about since the facilities are so close to the school, we have to think about the safety of the kids. So thinking that this upcoming summer is probably going to be pretty aggressive. So we're probably thinking about the following summer is what we're hoping. When you want to yeah, absolutely. Great. Great. Well, these guys are here tonight. They've got this out in the lobby, and, and uh, we're going to talk about it on our show, Closer Look on Tuesday as well. But when somebody sees this and says, man, I want to be a part of that, well, how do they, what do they do? They send you money, or who, what do they do? They sure can. Yeah, you just, you just send us money. Uh, there, we, have a, we have a website. It's shboostersclub.com. You can do it there. On there we have uh, credit card, uh, Venmo, PayPal. Um, if not that, we have uh, donation cards that you can get here at the game um, or contact a booster member. We can, we can definitely hook you up, yeah. Well, you've done it the right way. S pretty slick brochures and, and uh, forms out there to fill out. You've done a good job. We wish you a lot of luck with it. Appreciate yeah. that. Uh, one final question, Eric, because I talked to some of my friends about coming down here and talking yeah. to you with us. They say, say, Henry, that small community is going to raise a million and a half. Isn't that a really ambitious project for you and your community? It is, but we live in such a generous community with, with and they have so much pride and, and, and they know when there's, when there's a need, there's a way to make it happen. And, you know, the, the proof's in the pudding, if you will, you know, we're, we're only doing it for a short period of time and you know, we're ready to 
raised $1 million. So I, I'm fully confident we're going to get to that 1.5. It's an amazing community that we live in. Hey, you can see there's a lot of very positive things going on here at St. Henry. This project is going to be one of them. Get on involved if you'd like to do that. Mark and I are going to take a break right now. We'll be back right after this. You've been watching an interview with a couple of Eric's. Thanks to the Eric's for spending that yeah. time with us. You know, off camera, they told us they had a few significant yeah. donors. And they, I said, will it be naming rights? They said, they asked not to. They yeah. just wanted to give the money. Isn't that amazing? That's really what amazing. a community. Yeah. You're in a community where, yeah, I don't need my name on the building. I don't need my name on the wall. I just want to be a part yeah. of something good in my community. That's a really a good yeah. thing. That's awesome. Hey, we'll be back in a minute with Plays of the Week. Hey, plays of the week, and we start with the St. Henry Versailles game. How about that? Great game it was, and we know we talk about Tyler Schlarman. Yeah, Tyler Schlarman, he can score, he can rebound. Watch Tyler Schlarman pass her right there, one-handed bounce pass through traffic, and Hules Camp finishes inside. How many times does Hules Camp sneak loose inside? But watch the pass. First of all, we split the trap right here, and here goes Schlarman. Catches his defender staring at the basketball. There's the bounce pass and the finish inside with the nice one dribble move, and that was a really nice pass by Tyler Schlarman. Then the significant out-of-bounds play. Watch the inbounds pass, the tip-in right there, that tip-in by Zach Niekamp. This is a perfectly executed out-of-bounds play. We get the cross screen, then we don't switch inside. Here's the lob, and we don't bring it down, bring it right up and score. And then after that, we're going to have a chance to look at the game winner. This is the one that puts the Henry ahead with five seconds to go. Here's the pass. Watch Ulanek go back door right here, and here's the bounce pass. Again from Hules Camp, and there's the game winner right there, and you can see the reaction of the fans from St. Henry because with just 4.7 left, they're going to go ahead. And here's the fake to the free point line, and then the back cut, and here's the reverse layup, and you called it, Mark. If he goes up on the other side of the floor, he gets that thing blocked, mm -hmm. but instead we get a basket. That's the game winner right there for St. Henry. We talk about this weave action so much, Mark, and what goes on in the weave, what coaches are trying to do when they weave on the perimeter so much. We got a chance to look at it here with Fort Laramie. What you're trying to do is get the defense to make a mistake. Watch Braun come off. Here the two defenders get confused and right to the rim and a good pass inside to Austin Siegel. Let's look at it again. The two defenders get confused right over here. Who's got who? And when that happens, you'll see number 11, and that's Brandewee come off the screen. And the two defenders are confused. He got to get help inside. Here's Austin Sleagel posting up inside, and they get a basket right there. Then our final look, once again, is just a really nice set of passes. This is a backdoor cut to Cathcart. The nice inside pass, and you can see the finish inside by Hills Camp. And Anna's going to go on to defeat Fort Laramie and hand them their second loss of the season. And watch the great pass again. Low bounce, row, underhanded pass through traffic to pump fake and to finish inside, and Anna wins the basketball game. All right, Mark, good job. We'll be right back with our final segment. Hey, it's time to preview the upcoming games, and we've got some good ones. You get to start off in the WBL. Well, the first two we're going to look at are WBL games, Mark, and right now it's Ottawa Glandorf and a chance to put this thing away. The Titans will come in at 19-1, 7-0. They're going to play at Wapak, who's 13-6, 5-2, along with Elida still chasing uh, against that uh, uh, Titan team that's playing so well right now. OG gets to host Elida on the Friday the 23rd, so they got a couple of chances to win this thing outright, but they can do it this week. Since January 6th, Ottawa Glandorf has scored 73 plus points in 9 of 11 basketball games. And during that time period, they, lost, they beat Defiance by 20 and 54 34. That was one of the ones that was under that 73 mark. And of course, the loss to Lexington we talked about a little bit a while ago. In those uh, 11 basketball games, they've been over 85 different times. They rolled up 97 against Salina, 96 against Eastwood, 101 against Kenton. And during that time period, Jay Kaufman averaging 19.9. He had 32 against Lima Senior during that spell. Owen Eagle, low, Owen Eagle, 13.7. Bryce Schrader, the sniper from the perimeter, averaging 12 points a game, and a lot of other guys scoring for him as well. Wapak's been living on the edge all year long. They're two and five in games decided by four points or less. So a basket or two here, either way, and Wapak has a better record than they do right now. Their losses in the WBL were to Kenton by two and by to seven against Shawnee. Very balanced scoring. We talked about them before. Shank. Good, Scott, their defense gives up only 44 points a game. They will be challenged this week by that very good uh, Titan offense. 
Wapak has Coldwater on Saturday, and they go to St. Mary's the following weekend for the last game of the regular season. All right, staying in the WBL, Elida travels to Kenton. Elida's 15 and three. All of their losses in the league, four and three in the WBL, including two in a row. At Kenton, 12 and seven, two and five in the league. Elida lost to Shawnee last weekend, 45-37. They went from 15 and 1 to 15 and 3 in a, in a heartbeat. Daniel Unruh, Dante Johnson, Skylar Smith all had 10 points, but right now they're having trouble scoring. Kenton, they gave up 101, as Mark said, to OG, but then they beat Allen East on Saturday night, 81 50. So full court pressure had a lot, made a lot of turnovers, and that really got them jump started against Allen East, so expect them to keep that idea against Elida. Jaron Sharp had 22 and 21 in the league. Landon Rush had 12 and 23. There you see the top leaders in the WBL right now. This is a game of a struggling offense, Elida, against a struggling defense, Kenton. We'll see what happens. But it's going to be a special night for Mark and I because our buddy Jerry Snodgrass, our former partner here at WOSN and assistant commissioner at the OHSAA, will join us. He's done that once every year for the last four years or so. Gives us a chance to catch up on the, the workings down in Columbus, and we can start our campaign for him to be the next commissioner. Yeah, we'll get that done. But Jerry's going to be with us Friday. you got to tune in and hear all the good stuff that yeah. Jerry's doing. Dr. Ross is resigning in August. They're kind of planning a successionary. We'll see what Jerry has to say about that. Certainly, he's been very, very busy uh, this year trying to take care of all the things that are going on there. Well, let's move on to a track game. When you say, I thought you guys just talked about this, Lima Senior at Finley. Well, we did because they played not long ago, and the Spartans won in a close basketball game. Well, they match up again this week. Lima Senior will come in at 11-9, 6-6 in the conference. Finley is 11-8. They are 5-6 in the conference. They have a chance to get caught up as far as number of games played in conference play because Finley goes to Toledo Central Catholic on Tuesday night. They have already defeated them once, 67-62. This will be a road game, and guess who led them in scoring? Roth and Nunn, <laughs> guys with 44 <laughs> points between the two of them and eight threes the first time around. Finley plays at Toledo Central Catholic on Tuesday. We know about those two scorers, Ryan uh, Roth, Ryan Nunn. Logston's in there as well. Uh, they are playing very, very well. They were held to just, Roth had just three points the other night when they lost to St. Francis. That's a hard thing to do as well as those guys shoot the basketball. Lima Senior, I think, is really coming on. They're three and four in the last five, three out of four in the last five, four basketball games. St. John's is the only loss in there for the Spartans. That was by seven in a game that was winnable. 19 again from B.J. Miller against Fremont Ross. Justeel Colon's having a good second half, the 6'8 post player. He had 19 against Fremont Ross, so they're starting to come around. Finley finishes at St. John's. Lima Senior finishes at Whitmer, and they may well see each other, as you saw during our tournament bracket show the other day. They are both in the Fostoria sectional as a part of the district that's played at the University of Toledo. Uh, Finley would have to win two games, both winnable basketball games. Lima Senior would have to defeat Springfield, and they would match up in the district semis. So it could be three rounds this year between those two schools. Putnam County League, Pandora Gilboa trying to finish off an undefeated league season in the Putnam County League. They are 17-1, 6-0 in the league. They go to Fort Jennings, 13-6, 3-3. That'll be a challenge for them. Pandora Gilboa beat Van Loo 72-36. Drew Johnson, again, had 20. Jared Brees, 12. Cooper McCullough had 11. Their only loss is the USV the whole season long. Friday, they play Liberty Benton. And then Fort Jennings on last Friday beat Jefferson 50-42. Saturday, they lost to New Bremen in overtime 62-59. Last night, they beat Houston 58-52. Six-foot-five senior Brandon Weary makes a big difference for them. There you can see Pandora Gilboa undefeated in the league. This will be a good game, but one that Pandora Gilboa, ranked number 14, expects to get. And one of my favorite non-conference matchups every year, Kaleida at 14 and 5, plays at Van Buren, who's 11 and 7. Continental will play uh, Kaleida on Friday night, and they, of course, had balanced scoring all year long. Lambert, Laudick, Wrecker, Clausen, Contritions uh, from Rebke inside, and Hovist. They've added the freshman, Luke Earhart, who's averaging 12 points a game in the 10 games he's played. He's been in double figures five times. On Friday night, North Van Buren gets North Baltimore. That's a key game for them because North Baltimore was 7-1 in conference play. Matthew Ayers, one of their leading scorers, at 23 points a game. Uh, Cade Stevenson averages 10.1. Matthew Ellis, Illif leads the BVC in field goal percentage. This was a five-point game a year ago, two points the year before that. Both Van Buren wins, one of my favorite non-conference matchups every year. A non-league matchup on Saturday night. Rushi, 13-6, but 10-1 in their league. Plays Marion Local, 15-4, 7-0 undefeated in the MAC. 
Rushi beat Fairlawn last Friday 61-49. Saturday they had a bad loss to Jefferson, Mark talked about. Last night they won at Houston 58-52. I think I said that wrong a little while ago. It was Rushi that beat Houston. Marion Local beat DSJ 49-43. Last night beat Versailles. We talked about that game. They are playing very, very well right now. That should be a fun game that we're going to go down and do. And it is a special night because that is pork chop night. <laughs> Nick Schultz is going to host the crew. We're going to go down there and eat pork chops. There you see Marion Local ahead in the MAC conference. Hey, pork chop night on Saturday. But Night to Shine was just recently here in, in Lima. You may have seen it in the paper on the news. For special needs individuals, the Tim Tebow Foundation, Lima First Assembly of God Church hosted it. UNOH and, and ONU students volunteered to run it. And the Tebow Foundation, you talk about a bright spot nationally and internationally, what Tim Tebow has done. 540 churches in 50 states and 16 countries it takes 175,000 volunteers and 90,000 guests to pull this off. And you talk about a guy that has done the right thing with his fame and fortune. That is Tim Tebow and the Tim Tebow Foundation. That is pretty cool. That's really cool. All right. Hey, let's put up our, our broadcast schedule for the coming week. We've got great games coming your way. As always, we're leading up to tournament. Stay with us. Look at all those ranked teams in there. We're going to be lucky to have some teams going maybe all the way to Columbus this year. We appreciate you joining us. We got some great games that we're going to be doing as well. All right, thanks for joining us. We will see you again next week on A Closer Look.